And councillors, just while we while we settle ourselves down, can I just am I the chair's rex there? So no, this is now the climb. This is the next item. This is item number nine. Can we just just give me a moment, councillors? Just just breathe. I know it's been a very long morning without a break, and for that I apologise. But I think it's just as long for our members of the public who are here as well. So can we just put up my reeks? Okay, good. So just explaining what we've got here. So we've got the recommendations as part of the item that appear in our agenda. But as Councillor Casey noted, people didn't have in front of them the recommendations that I am wanting to add as Chair's recommendations from, um, from the Chair. And the, the approach was to put the recommendations that go with the item in the agenda, and I will then add these as F. So you'll note that yours go as far as E, which says consider the declaration for a climate change in, in emergency, and then my chair's recs go on from F. So I'm happy to move A through to whatever our last number, or A and the whole of F. I know the mayor's happy to second. And I don't think we there isn't a presentation that's required. We've got questions that can be answered by Jacques. But just in, in moving that, um, members, there's not a, a huge amount to add. We've had some eloquent presentations from our community, and it's on the back of those that I'm happy to, to move these recommendations. And I know that I've said in the past that I don't believe in hollow statements and nor do I believe in um, grand political gestures. This, however, is one that our community have asked for. It does provide us the opportunity to actually call for action and to line up what is being asked of us, that we view all of our council decisions through a climate change lens. And you'll note that we ask in here for... Um, I just can't, sorry, oh, I can't. can we just scroll up? I just want to show the, can I just undermine mm -hmm. the recommendation that calls for the voluntary and then mandatory recommendations <laughs> as part of the council? Are they in there? Yeah. It's under, sorry, I just can't quite read it. That's it. And I just want to note the one part that was raised before and Councillor Casey raised it, that we ask for on a voluntary basis initially because there's concern that we don't necessarily have the most robust process of doing this in the beginning, but then moving to mandatory climate change impact statements on all committee reports. And we'll start, we'll start that with the Environment and Community Committee, a voluntary process which will have a climate change impact statement on all of the relevant um, reports. So, Mr Mayor, as the seconder, would you like to speak? Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, for the opportunity, because I've got uh, council business I need to attend to and may be late coming back for this debate. Um, I think it is time to change the language that we are using now. Climate warming almost sounds benign and passive when you take into account that what we're dealing with is a process which, if left unchecked, is going to have catastrophic impacts on us environmentally, economically and financially. I hesitated when I first heard the suggestion about emergency because for me, emergency is what happens when you have something that occurs suddenly and needs to be responded to suddenly, such as a flood uh, or an earthquake. But actually when I thought about it, uh, this is an emergency because if we do not act now, then we will face the sort of devastation that we normally associate with one of those sudden events. The fact that it takes longer won't lessen the impact that it has on us as human beings and our environment. The Prime Minister said this was our nuclear-free moment and uh, for this generation. And I was one of those that protested against 
the uh, build-up of nuclear arms uh, decades ago. We actually haven't solved that problem. It's still there. Uh, if it happens, it will be devastating immediately. We hope it never happens, but what we know about global warming, global heating, is that it is happening. We're seeing, as Niwa points out, the impact on our mean annual temperatures rising. We're seeing the impact on the coastlines and the low-lying areas of, of extreme weather events and, and global lifting. We are seeing the frequency of extreme weather events increasing. There is no challenge to the reality of, of, of global emissions causing the heating up of the earth, whatever Donald Trump might say about it. And, you know, while we rely on international action and national action, action starts actually in our community, our city and our country. And we have to play a role in that. I look with real concern at the figures that have been presented to us. Uh, the temperature rises in Auckland over the last six or seven years. Um, the, the, the impact um, has been has been quite quite critical. Our global emissions are going up by six, or has, have gone up by six or seven percent. If we do not start acting now, those global emissions by 2050 will have gone up by 28 percent. And we cannot afford to allow that to happen. I was incredibly impressed this morning by the presentations of our younger people, our, our rangatahi. And as someone who was uh, reasonably recently a grandfather and expecting another grandchild in another six months, I and our generation, which is represented pretty strongly around this table, have to recognise what legacy it is we are leaving for generations to come. And I don't want to leave the rotten legacy of climate heating that undermines the the well-being, the lifestyle, uh, and, and the very existence of, of generations for the future. We have an obligation to act, and it would be irresponsible and reckless of us not to act. And that is why I'm supporting this particular recommendation. I... In declaring an emergency, what are we doing? Some say it's symbolic. Well, I think actually it's more than symbolic. It's indicating the urgency with which we have to respond to the challenge in front of us. But I want to say that the framework that we have just passed is only one step, and it's only a step in the right direction, and it won't go far enough. What we actually have to do is that we have to have a detailed action plan. And that detailed action plan, like anything that we do around this table, has to be costed, and we have to indicate where the revenue is coming from to pay for that. You know, we thought we did the right thing in the last long-term plan, putting 40 million aside for, for um, climate change, 90 million aside for coastal management. That won't be enough. We will need to invest much more heavily, and we're not investing our own money, we're investing the money of our community. And that makes it critical that we carry our community with us. We have to have an education and awareness program to demonstrate precisely what we're going to do, how it's going to impact, and how we're going to pay for it. I'm sure in this room, if we take a vote right now, we'd get near to 100% of people that are supporting that. But in the wider community, that is where we have to be persuasive and we have to demonstrate that the money that we are investing is a critical investment for our well-being and our future, and even more important than that, the future of our children and our grandchildren. So I want to end on what that placard said. I think it's a beautiful placard. Dear adults, time is running out. It is running out, and this resolution is needed to say that our intention is to act now. We will do it thoroughly. We will cost it properly. We will in indicate that what we are doing is the best way to counteract it, but do it we must. There is no issue more important ahead of us in the next three years and decade 
than tackling the problem of the heating of our earth and the devastating effect that it will have on generations to come. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm very proud to second your resolution and congratulate you on your role in bringing that forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, focus in on two specific aspects of the report and the recommendation here today. The first one uh, in point five, referring to this um, scan of uh, other cities around the world uh, who have declared climate emergency declarations, and it refers to the UK and Vancouver and, and even uh, Nelson. And there certainly um, have been a number of declarations in the UK um, over 90 councils have uh, committed to going carbon neutral by 2030, and that largely uh, has come about at the end of last year after the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its report, which, which basically, without going into too much detail, said a 1.5 degrees would be devastating, 2 degrees would be catastrophic, and currently uh, the world heading to 3 to 4 uh, degrees. But in many respects... Um, those cities and countries are a bit late to the party too. If you look at some of the other cities and countries around the world, Scotland, for instance, and one of the speakers today referred to that, they had a Climate Change Act in 2009, nearly a decade ago, which amongst other things um, set a greenhouse gas reduction targets of 80% by 2050 and an interim target of 42% by 2020. That's next year. Uh, good old Scotland. They're, they're going to be halfway there by next year. More importantly from us, they uh, imposed a number of duties on their councils, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, putting in place measures to adapt for a changing climate uh, and working in a sustainable way. And if you go and look at any of the councils in Scotland, like Aberdeen, you will see them walking the talk. There's been a lot of uh, uh, discussion today about uh, whether and this action is symbolic or whether it's real. Well, obviously, people are judged by what they do, not by what they say. Uh, and in a Aberdeen, if you look through the council documents, no matter where you look, you get a sense of real commitment to combating climate change, um, whether it be from their, their general statements of intent, uh, leading and acting as an example to others, reducing emissions, they go into the schools to get it out into the community. They commit to delivering projects that um, adapt to climate change. If you go to their corporate intent, similarly, and someone today presenting talked about um, equivocal language. There's no equivocal language in Aberdeen. We will design and construct all new infrastructure to be energy efficient. We will continue to invest in green energy transport projects and sector and so on. They are emphatic, they mean it, and they are doing it. I hope that this is a a pattern that Auckland Council uh, will certainly follow here, because we do need to in Auckland. In our report, between 2009 and 16, our overall emissions increased by 5.6%. In Scotland, they're going back 42%. We're going forward 56 and if we continue on that path, it'll be 27% by 2050. So we have every reason to act and act quickly in Auckland. Um, Recommendation C that's up there refers to what is this climate emergency really uh, in terms of uh, yeah, any uh, definition under the Act. Uh, there, there isn't one, and a declaration of climate emergency has no other inherent statutory or legal implication. So it's up to us to make it mean something and, and, and to respond to the overwhelming demand from people here today. I would just say, though, in concluding, that it is going to be actions that we're judged by, not policies or documents. There's a very good article and stuff about this meeting today, which talked about Auckland Council having all the right bits of paper, or making all the right noises, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, that's, that's certainly true, but it's action that people are looking for. And I would just say, um, and not to pour cold water on the celebrations, that some of our track records in this respect isn't too great. And one of the other 
um, important environmental matters of this, of this century, uh, the use of um, a chemical sprays. We have a policy that says all the right things since 2013. The groups that came in here and employed it much in the same way as our, our climate uh, action supporters today uh, were initially buoyed by that. Six years on, they're entirely disillusioned because on the ground there has been no action and at a time when around the world all other countries have been, many other countries have been moving to ban and, and to restrict the use of glyphosate. In here, other, certain parts of Auckland have actually gone backwards. They've gone back two decades. So I would just say that I hope our action today uh, will respond to the overwhelming demand of our own people. And for that to happen, I agree with my colleague over there who does walk the talk and has always walked the talk that we get people from our communities to be involved in that because in my view that's the only way this council is going to be held accountable on a decision by decision basis. So I hope during that consultation ladies and gentlemen that you or your representatives ask to be involved in monitoring and seeing that this just isn't noise and words, it is action. Thank you. I'll follow on from Councillor uh, Watson, and it's against the background where the blunt reality is that our track record is incredibly poor. If you rate us with other cities, and John mentioned some, I could mention a whole raft of them, and countries for that matter, that are reducing their emissions. And New Zealand has not done that, and Auckland has not done that. The number of cars on the road is going up. The emissions from those cars is, are arguably also going up in many quarters. But what really concerns me is, if I track down to F, just what voluntary means, because we need urgency around that. And if I give you just a sense of that urgency right now. So as we speak, we have a downtown tram that cannot connect to Britomart because Panuku is not designing a bridge to allow it. Are we going to deal with that? We have Panuku allowing apartments along the water's edge at Hobsonville, at West Park. And the unitary plan was changed to allow that. Right on the water's edge, I ask you. We have RFA planning to decimate a stadium at Western Springs with a huge loss of sunk carbon and build an entirely new facility for New Zealand cricket at huge cost, 100 million. But that 100 million is a huge amount of sunk, councillor, councillor, sunk councillor, capital. Can we, I know these are issues I'll you're passionate that. about. Can we just stick to the item I'll in stick hand? to that. So our trees across Auckland are being consistently decimated, decimated as we speak because there is no blanket protection for trees. So yes, we can have an urban forest strategy. But as I speak today, there will be hundreds of trees across Auckland, if not more, being systematically felled. And some of them very mature specimens of Pahutukawa and others that are Taonga. And they are disappearing as we speak. And I know where they are. Many of us know where they are. And what have we done? When I asked for us to do some reporting around that, to at least arrive at the data to support a plan change, there was scarcely any support around the council table. We've got water care, treating water to the nth degree and then tipping it into the sea with no reuse virtually at all. Compare that with other cities. We've got a report from the urban, from the audit and risk department that's mentioned in here that categorises this issue as moderate, moderate residual risk rating. I'll repeat that, moderate residual risk rating. That's part of what we're considering today. We had no increase in our budget for climate change this year. We've got seawalls going up without any consideration of the Ministry for the Environment's dynamic adaptive pathways response. So if we look at what we're doing on a decision-by-decision decision basis, and I endeavour to bring this to the attention of councillors on every decision, we're often making the wrong decisions, and we're continuing to do that. So are you going to address those issues that I'm raising with you right now? Because they are fundamental. Are we going to allow the tram downtown 
that runs on electricity that saves significant emissions to actually go to Britomart? Are we going to allow Panuku to stop that? Because that is precisely what they're doing now. And that's just one example. So coming back to the Mayor's comment, act now. Yes, we need to act now. To Councillor Watson's comment, walk the talk. Yes, we need to do that. And yes, let's do something voluntary. But frankly, we're beyond voluntary and it should be mandatory. So can we have a report on how quickly that can happen? Thank you, and my apologies for the uh, elevation. <laughs> that's, that's quite okay. It's an issue we're all passionate about. Just on the voluntary to mandatory, um, we we could have put in requiring the reports to be mandatory. Again, I think it's much better to have good work than hasty work. People could have made up any old tosh about climate change um, and put it in as a statement. I'd much rather it be absolutely valid and meaningful, because if we are going to make our decision and through the climate change lens, we need to make sure that lens is accurate, that it withstands scrutiny, and that it fundamentally changes the way this council operates. So I'm happy to wait for a few weeks while we do it better. Councillor Hills. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, it does feel a bit strange calling an emergency on something that probably should have been called when I was a kid or earlier. Um, but I support it, and I support uh, the framework that we just passed as well. I think it's clear from everyone here today, but also the action across our country and across, broke my pen, <laughs> across the world that this is an issue that we all must act on in every part of the word. And we keep talking about cost all the time, but I think the greatest cost is not doing anything. And we never seem to measure that. We always talk about the cost of infrastructure or the cost of a policy or the cost of electrifying, but we never talk about what the actual cost of doing nothing is, the cost to the environment, the cost to our animals, the cost to our future generations. And it's so fantastic to see everyone here, but especially um, the rangatahi that came and spoke. I remember a few years, I wasn't on the council then, a few years ago, when young people came here to speak on the unitary plan and about the want and the need to live within a city and close to public transport, close to cycling and walking, they were booed by a whole lot of older people, none that are here today, but they were also, th those, those people that booed those young people were supported by some of the councillors around this table exactly. on those decisions, on the unitary plan, yep. and I'm actually glad to hear the young people saying now that they will keep us all honest on those issues. When we try and turn a car park into something else and people vote against that or cause other issues, around that. So I think we all need to step up, but on every decision, actually be accountable to what decisions we're making on those issues. I do really, really support the fact that the action plan has been working with people along the way. I worry if we go over four weeks, I don't think we can call something an emergency and then consult for more than four weeks when so much work has been done for so long. The Auckland plan last year clearly sets out our plans on, on climate change. This is part of that. We've already voted for 1.5. We've already voted against deep sea oil drilling um, consents in and around our city. I think we're already on our way and people know what climate change is. If they don't know, they're pretending. Um, the science, there's no debate anymore, the science. Yes, we can say 95% of scientists, but we don't actually, we shouldn't be debating it. It's like debating if water is wet and unfortunately all our ankles we're ankle deep in the wet when it rains now. So I think we can see what is happening in all our communities. And unfortunately, people are jumping to seawalls and jumping to, to building things to prevent the water coming in instead of looking at the major problem. And I don't actually see us as too little or too small to make a difference, because that's just a cop out, because every single person can be making a difference. When we talk about nuclear free, it was actually Devonport six years before the government um, changed its mind or made up mind, Devonport said they would be a nuclear-free borough council, and the dominoes happened from there um, through all the other borough councils and across New Zealand at the time. But I think it's clear that everyone in this room is speaking up, and it shouldn't be a young versus old or um, rural versus city or anything like that. I think everyone <laughs> is affected, but what we have seen um, is the big, loud protest from younger people potentially um, lately because we know the dire, dire effects of doing nothing. So, Martini, 
Mamono Karapa Tifai. By many, th- by many, by thousands, the work will be accomplished. This is all of us in this room and the city that need to act now, because if we don't, um, well, we all know what we're heading for, so, or what we've already got to. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for everyone who's working on this, but we need to do this faster and starting now. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kosey. I won't take too long. I just want to agree with my colleague, Councillor Walker. Um, the climate emergency flag needs to be hoisted every day here, every day. It needs to be hoisted at every local board meeting. It needs to be hoisted at every council controlled organisation meeting. And one of the ways we can do that is simply tell them to put in a climate impact report. Now, we did that with the Maori impact statement. And some of them were good, some of them were bad. They got better. If David was here, he would, he would <laughs> talk to that. No, they're very good. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to take out the words voluntary in the first instance just because of that. We just do it. And I also want to add in another bullet point that says that we direct... Uh, we can't direct the local boards. We can suggest that local boards do the same. But we can direct the CCOs to have a climate impact statement in their reports. So that is something we can do today, and it's, it's yeah, yeah. unequivocal. So I, I'll, you don't, I, do I need to move to remove the words? Just, just, I mean, I, I didn't have voluntary in there. I just had that we were going to do it. The advice I had from staff is that the capacity wasn't there. If it's the will of the meeting for us to just do it yeah. and then um, work out how to resolve it, then that is the, the will of the meeting. If there's general agreement... People are happy. We'll just work it out. And just another bullet point with, with regard staff. to the council-controlled organisations, or comma, and and its council-controlled organisations. Just we we're just doing this bit there, so we take out the initial on a voluntary basis. And you were wanting to add in. Yeah. Suggesting that the CC- we direct the CCOs to do the same and we suggest to the local boards that they... they I don't know how we do the local boards. We don't direct the local boards. What do, we do direct the CCOs, yeah. so we'll do that one first. So can I suggest in the interests of practicality, I, I'm really, I would be very, very happy for us to simply start doing the climate change impact statement on committee reports. However, I think we probably need to talk with our local boards and (coughs) suggest to them that that would be a good idea once we're doing it. And um, the same with our CCOs. We'll we'll put that in. Agree with the CCO. I'm just... I'd like to test that one with the meeting. I think that this is a chance for us to see, you know, they make big decisions. They make bigger decisions than we do sometimes. And they do need to, to consider climate change. And I, I, OK, so let's let's deal with our... We can, we can make decisions out of, you know, I am in the mood. Usually I will join in criticism of CCOs. However, if you look at Auckland Transport and Panuku, they are walking the talk. Panuku is doing urban density around this table, and sorry, everyone's had a little say. I will have my say. Councillor Richard Hills absolutely called it. We sat at a meeting here where our young people were almost spat at, they were sworn at, and they were derided for requiring urban density and getting rid of at-grade car parks and changing some of our our plans, our unitary plans, to make them climate change resilient and fit for the future. I will never forget that. It's possibly one of the most vile meetings that I've, I've experienced. Around this table, this current table, we have people who voted against selling at grade car parks, who have voted against changing the unitary plan to require mandatory car parking in apartments, which we should get rid of, have voted against public funding for for public transport initiatives, who voted against the petrol tax, and who have voted against issues that are climate change resilience um, initiatives, and instead have been led along the populist path to support the things that some of our communities want. They've derided the lowering of speed limits, they've encouraged the widening of roads, and they've, um, you know, conducted this 
the business of some of these committees in a way that is not uh, commensurate with this. And now I'm really interested that I'm hearing some of those same people saying completely the opposite. So I think this is our one chance where we can all pull together on this one issue. There's an awful lot of this going on. If we line up behind the emergency and we line up behind the framework, I think we can start making decent decisions. But let's not pretend that we haven't tried to make some decent climate change decisions around this committee that have been voted down because of populist interference by... Um, some of our community who are still denying climate change. It's, it, is, it, it makes me very, very angry. So we'll, well get said, back to it. Well said, Councillor. Well said, Chair. Well said. Thank you. So if we can just... A little bit of rewriting of history going on, and I think we all need to focus on the issue in hand. I've got Councillor Newman, Councillor Darby, Councillor Lee, Councillor Bartley and Councillor Cashmore. Hopefully that will be taken as everyone having their speaking time, and then we will break, because I think we're probably in urgent need of that. Thank you. Councillor Newman. What? No. <laughs> Councillor Newman. You know, Chair, we've got a draft climate action framework... Um, and now this item, and I think it's a pretty pale imitation of what climate action should actually look like. Um, today we're going to say emergency, but actually I think the public needs to be very aware that we are in grave danger of being business as usual. I'm not happy with how this council and how this country addresses climate change. We have a zero carbon amendment bill. That is a government bill that has no enforceable targets. The Prime Minister said this is her nuclear moment and a government bill that contains climate change targets that are not enforceable. Greenpeace is right. All bark, no bite. At this table, Madam Chair, we've got people who voted for a unitary plan, a unitary plan that, in my view, is very permissive. Sediment choked rivers and streams and filthy sediment choked harbours from development runoff permitted by this council. We have a declared intention by the government to remove the rural urban boundary. They set it out in the state in the speech from the throne to unlock land supply. Is building a bridge from Weymouth to Karaka good for the environment? Is building houses on floodplains at Tuckanini North and at Drury good for families? How about building houses on ancient sacred lands at Ahumatau? Is that good for people? I have a $24 million shared path project for a cycleway in my ward, Madam Chair, which links Manirewa to Conifer Grove to Karaka and to Papakura, built this year. And now I'm discovering that apparently Auckland Transport has no budget for a cycle link at Walter Streetens Drive. Mm. Only Papakura in my ward is currently diverting food waste from landfill. Now, we can cope with that because Papakura is but a fraction of Auckland, but how are we going to cope because we've got no food waste plant for Auckland? Well, and yeah. My turn to speak. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, we, can we just... And you can speak shortly. Not now. That's not, no, counts, Councillor, let, provide... can we just, Councillor, we've been... We've, this has actually remained respectful and sensible. No, you, as, you departed uh, there. Counts, whoa, Councillor... Councillor, as my, my job as chair is just to, as we did with other councillors, to say, and Councillor Wayne Walker was very generous in his acceptance of it, can we just keep to the... To the, the we provide no practical, scalable facility for green waste. We take food waste only, not green waste. Where is the solution to the recycling mountain for Auckland following China's exit from the market? We lord subsidies to provide public transport services for those who have abundant services, but it's fairly lonely going for those of us who are trying to negotiate an extension of public transport to communities that don't have it. Now, I'm going to get a bus service in Karaka Lakes, and I'll get it this year, but it has been very difficult given that that subdivision was built over six years ago. In New Zealand, we have property owners who were not able to claim depreciation deductibility for their buildings. Our commercial towers and our factories are some of the oldest, most obsolete and inefficient in the world. 
they're far less efficient than in places like America and Australia. You know, Chair, it is a conundrum, isn't it? Why the, the steelworkers of Pittsburgh went and voted for Donald Trump. But, you know, in America, you can claim 2.56% per annum for deductibility of buildings. How much can you claim in New Zealand? You can, you can claim nothing. And we wonder why it is that, you know, those steel workers vote for Donald Trump and why assembly workers in Sunderland go and vote for Brexit and why blue-collar workers in North Queensland, they elect the coalition government. And we wonder why... Uh, we have governments there that are succeeding despite the fact there'll be people in this, in this room who would think that's deplorable. Chair, the problem with climate change is this. It generally involves a process of change which is painful for those in our community who have the least and that change is directed by people who have the most. And what I want to say to the public is that in voting for this, which I will, it is very important that you hold this council and all governments in this country to account that it has to be more than symbolic, more than abstract, and it has to be applied. Because the danger is that we all have our feel-good moment for Facebook, but in reality, the momentum sort of ebbs away because the actual plan for change is incredibly contentious and it is not equitable and it generally involves people who, having, who have the least paying the greatest price. So I don't expect applause for this speech, Chair, but I think it's appropriate that all sides of this debate get reflected. Thank you. Just doing a check, we've got Councillor Darby Lee, Bartley Cashmore Simpson, Philip Iner. If we are still comfortable, we can keep going till 1.30. Are people comfortable with that? We can cope and then break at 1.30? OK. Councillor Darby. Thanks, Chair. Uh, look, that's why earlier on I suggested this paper go first. And wouldn't it have been different uh, if we had have done this paper before the uh, climate change action framework paper. Um, for this paper, we're actually debating it. We didn't debate the former. For this paper, our debate is animated, energised and somewhat loud. Um, and uh, it wasn't that for the former paper, which really uh, has me questioning, did we really read the first paper? Did we really read that there were 60 actions identified in that paper? That there was a plan, an action plan? And then sitting under that, there were subsets of other actions, and they would apply to our CCOs, the whole part of our, or all parts of our organisation. Um, and I can't help but think, looking back, we've now, we're now declaring the emergency, you know, the call to arms, the call to action. Uh, yet in the first paper, we actually backpedalled. We changed words out from plan to framework. And I won't go back on that one. We actually discussed why we wouldn't consult with urgency or what we wouldn't consult as the staff were ready to do. Their technical paper was deep. We should have got really engrossed with that and this is important, but for some reason we've just done a flip and made our big focus here. And, the, and where we actually deal with the emergency, we've yeah. done a light over easy. I think there's been some talk also not only of we need more time with our community, even though... Our staff said they're ready, and, they've got, and there's an attachment there which says, confirms they're ready to go to public engagement. Then there's the talk of, we need to get the cost accountants to look at every conceivable cost of the actions. Councillor Hills has covered my ground, really. It is, I would say, what is the cost of inaction first? That's the first cost that you need to look at. And that's something that we've discussed in our many workshops, 
the cost of inaction. Now suddenly the brakes are going on because we haven't got the cost accountants in. Important, yes, but that comes in the next stage, except we're putting the brakes on, park it up a little bit, delay it, and then we come to the emergency paper. I don't get it. Um, what, I, what I would like to say is, look, there have been a lot of contradictions here today. People have spoken about things that we're not doing, um, and there's been a lot of convenience in that as well, because they've admitted their own contradictions along the way. Yeah. Um, and I think we're at risk here of finding ourselves in an absolute muddle on climate change um, unless we get our house in order. And I think we need to get our political house in order for a start. I'm very aware of a lot of work that's been done within the, the management. For example, the emissions reduction plan. There is an emissions reduction plan that has been confirmed by our executive leadership team but there's clay in the way. And that's political clay. It's not our staff. So let's deal to the clay that we're responsible for. I think, Madam Chair, this call to action uh, in a call to arms is, is really important. And I will be supporting this but it's got to be backed up with our real actions, our real political actions from here on in. And I note the last one there that we have climate impact statements on our agendas. I think that's been long overdue and some of us have discussed that. Um, but I would hope that that doesn't have to go through the mill that the Māori impact statements have had to go through and how often um, the Independent Māori Statutory Board has reminded us that there have just been cursory uh, ticks to those reports and that they are, have not been genuinely addressed. But I think today has um, actually been a bit of a wake-up call for me uh, personally because um, I'm, I'm really not convinced that we know quite what we're doing and what our plan is. And to calling this emergency and then reflecting on the first paper, uh, I think confirms that we have got a lot of work to do to prepare not just the council, but the city to address climate change. It's not something breathing down our neck. It's not something at the gate. It's actually here right now. It's surrounding us. It's enveloping us, and uh, we've still got balls in the air, and we need to juggle a lot better than what we have to today, uh, and it's been pretty clear to me that we have not got a handle on it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, ladies and gentlemen, I've been listening very carefully today to the presentations, particularly those of our young people. And I agree with them that there is no doubt at all than the threat, that the threat of climate change is an ex existential threat um, to all of us and to the whole planet. It is a global problem, but we can make a difference, as in a moral way at least, but we need to make a tangible difference as well. And that means significant changes, radical changes, not necess necessarily in, in the way we live, but certainly in the assumptions um, by which we live and the assumptions indeed which guide this council. We can make a moral ex example as we did with the nuclear free issue, but as the mayor has pointed out, the nuclear threat 
has not gone away at all, despite our best endeavours. And maybe we thought we won the battle and forgot about it and moved on to something else. But the threat is still there, and that is equally an existential threat to life on this planet. In the doomsday clock, scientists have now moved the clock to two minutes before midnight. Why? Because of the growing threat of nuclear war and climate change. So it's not just a matter, a technical, a neat technical matter of containing emissions and all will be well. It's much more serious and demanding of us than that. We also, I believe, need to um, look closer to home, and, and I'm talking about Auckland Council. I would have to say that Auckland Council is, is as guilty as any city or any country in terms of its role in climate change. Why is that? Well, underlying all of this, climate change, after all, is the effect, not the cause. We sometimes discuss climate change, you know, sea level rising, things getting warmer, ice caps degrading, melting. Um, that will be catastrophic. But all of that is the cause rather than the effect. And what is the cause? Well, part of the cause is that the growth of human population. We heard discussion about Whakapapa and our links to our ancestors. There are more people living on the planet now, more human beings living on the planet now than ever lived, than any human lived before since the emergence of the Homo sapiens species. We also have a worldwide system of exploitive capitalism that is inherently unstable. It's based on growth and more growth and consumerism and planned obsolescence. And all of this has a huge environmental effect on the planet, on forests, on rivers, on the oceans, on the air and therefore, of course, the climate. So we also have to consider that as well. So what can we do in the Auckland Council? Well, I think we have to have a heart-searching look at ourselves. And I believe there's a strong consensus around the room, um, but unfortunately, um, uh, an unhappy note was uh, injected with talk about who voted for what in the unitary plan, and that old people came into the council and objected to their suburbs being torn down and replaced by high-rise developments. Be in no doubt about the unitary plan, and vested interests like the property council's ardent support for it. It was about growth and more growth. Growth in the inner city, yes. Intensive growth, yes. High-rise growth, yes. Ur urban sprawl into the rural areas equally, though that's not talked about as much. But all of that activity, based on growth, based on not only acknowledging more and more people coming into Auckland and New Zealand, but actually cheerleading for more and more growth. And of course, that is just not sustainable anywhere, and so we have to address that fundamental question. And so, uh, Madam Chair, I want to talk about issues that we're dealing with here and now, because we have to, while thinking globally, we have to act locally. And is it sustainable for us? Not only do we welcome cruise ships, but now we're trying to have more and more giant cruise ships. That's just another example, and we will get our ratepayers to pay for wharf extensions into the harbour to facilitate that. Is that sustainable? I, I, I don't think so. I, 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 I want to support um, many um, points that colleagues around the room 
the positive ones, not the negative ones, that have injected and, and contributed to this debate. But I, I go back to um, board member Renata Blair, when he called upon us to look after the forest, look, look after the bush, look after the rivers, look after the lakes, look after the oceans, look after the air, Thank look you, after Councilor. the endangered if you can just, species. If you can just and wrap we, it up now. And if we do that, um, the climate will look after itself. So it's just not a, a matter of technically reducing emissions, but actually a fundamental change in the way we live in this city, in this country and on this planet. Thank you very much. Four more councillors. Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to this. And thanks, Jacques, for, um, for, for presenting this report. Um, I, I, I really wanted to be here today. Uh, given what I'm going through uh, personally with my family, I, um, I, I wanted to be here for this item and also to hear from the, the public forum. Uh, and I give my apologies that I have to leave uh, after this item. But I wanted to, to speak in support of the recommendations. Because in my ward, I have low income, I have middle income, and I have high income. And this is one of those issues where there's a unified um, agreement to do something about this. And um, I, I look at the, I, I heard the, the quote that someone mentioned earlier, that which is joined together becomes an unbroken line. And I wanted to be here today to present that viewpoint from my ward uh, to do something about this climate crisis. Uh, and I believe that, that, that council is doing a good job in terms of taking leadership in this. I've sat in the workshops that we've had about climate and um, I just, can't get over the um, enormity of the task to try and address this issue. So I hope that the public consultation will garner more partners to come on board to help us um, ad uh, you know, address this climate crisis that we're experiencing. But I want to speak from a Pacific perspective, and it's quite timely because I have the flower in my ear to prove it. So um, there's a Pacific, uh, there's a Samoan proverb, it's ele which means the coconut tree doesn't sway on its own, but is swayed by the wind. And it speaks of the spiritual, innate connection of our ancestors to their natural environment and, all that, and, that, and that all things are connected. And I want to acknowledge um, and appreciate Johnny Freeland's comments about the Pacific, about tangata whenua and whakapapa and symbiotic relationships. Because for the people of Kiribati, Tuvalu, Tukalu Islands, they're already suffering uh, from, from climate change, from this climate crisis. So I really do appreciate uh, his comments there. I want to thank the people that spoke in the public forum uh, because their, their passion and advocacy gives me hope for our future. Um, so yeah, uh, I also wanted to say that uh, I think about some of the decisions that were made in the past by, by decision makers back then, and I always wonder what they were thinking of when they made those decisions and for whose benefit those decisions were made. And I struggle to understand uh, decisions that were made, for instance, in Pamua to put development on Mokoya Pa, which is a site of significant um, cultural importance, especially for Ngāti Paua, or to put a motorway through Te Hopua Arangi Tuffering in Onihanga. And so I look at those decisions, I struggle how, why they made those decisions, but with this decision to support these recommendations, I can see very clearly who we are thinking of and who will benefit from these decisions of these recommendations, and that is the, the future of all Aucklanders, of all our communities, now and in the future. So on that note, I say thank you, and I um, support this fully. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Councillor Cashmore. Very briefly, Madam Chair, hey tangata, hey tangata, hey tangata, and that sums it up, doesn't it? It's about the people. It's about the people. It's about the people. And climate change <clears throat> is an inevitability, and we're facing with it, and you'd have to live under a rock to deny it. 
the solutions we have to find, we have to find together. There will be some pain that has to be shared together. No one person, no one industry, no one grouping is more responsible than any other. Collectively, we have allowed this to come upon ourselves and we need now to solve it together. And it's good to see, Madam Chair, I believe, what will be a unanimous vote around this table in support of declaring a climate emergency. And I'd like to recognise your leadership over many years in advocacy for the environment and particularly for this particular bit of work today. And to acknowledge John and his team who have worked so diligently to produce something that is pragmatical, is achievable, and will actually put gains on the ground for this council. We've made a start with some of our water work, with our environment work. The LTP numbers that was put towards that, the transport fuel tax, all of these things add to the toolbox to deliver better environmental outcomes and to help reduce the effects of this catastrophe we are looking at. So, Madam Chair, I congratulate the team and express my support for this ongoing work. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Simpson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and before, I want you to, the people in the audience, just to hold if I th think I'm going to say something wrong first. Um, I'm conflicted with this, and I tell you why. Because I believe that the science of climate change is irrefutable, um, without a doubt. But when I read this paper, it didn't, uh, and I agree with the recommendations that the staff put together, right? Um, the, the paper itself didn't stand alone for me and provide all the information required to de declare a climate emergency. So I went to the University of Auckland, Madam Chair, and I asked the university who would be the best senior professor who's an expert in this field to give me advice. A person came to my office yesterday, as you well know. She told me that she read the report and she didn't believe that the information in the report would lead to us make, for, for me to make a decision, or anybody making a decision, um, for a strong case to declare climate emergency. Now, she also said, of course, there is indeed uh, scientific evidence to support that anthropogenetic climate change is occurring and that evidence is readily available. But the evidence contained within the report is not sufficient to cause a high level of concern. Now, I'm also, as you're well aware, chair of the Quality Advice Programme, and I believe that you should have good advice when making decisions. The advice in this report doesn't lead to make the decision that I think everybody wants around the table. Um, I actually share Councillor Darby's concern. I would have liked this to be first. But um, she, this, this lecturer also, senior professor actually, also said to me that they wouldn't expect to receive unsupported arguments such as in this report in their role on other boards that they sit on, sit on. And that they said that they would send unsupported, poorly evidenced report, reports back to the authors. Having said that, my ward has terrible problems in Tamaki Drive and has got flooding issues. So I say uh, I want to, um, I would have preferred climate crisis because if you look up the definition of emergency, it's a serious, and yes it is serious, it's unexpected. I don't think it's unexpected. I think it is expected. Um, and, it's, and it says it's an often dangerous situation. Yes, I think it is dangerous, but I don't think it's unexpected. I think it is expected. So I would have preferred to declare a climate crisis. And I absolutely support, support the work that we are going to do behind the scenes to get to that point. Um, so I'm, I'm conflicted because how many of you have done the Making Good Decisions course? If you've done that course and you read the paper, you would not declare climate emergency. So I'm going to take one step back from that and I'm going to say that the way that the staff have put the paper and the resolutions that they have put together I think is fine. All right? Madam Chair, you've taken it a step further and what you put in your recommendations was a link to evidence. 
And that, I think, probably gives me my hat of being able to make a good decision enough to get me across the line. I fervently believe in climate, uh, that the, as I said, the science of climate change is irrefutable, and we have evidence right on my back doorstep. Um, but I am sorry that we haven't put together a paper that the public have all the you know, that, that shows the public that we are making a decision based on the um, on the right evidence. I go back to young Sarah. I don't know whether she's still here. She's still here. Young Sarah. She was at the uh, public forum. She said the public can't make right decisions without the right information, and we shouldn't either. So I'm just sorry we didn't have that information in a better form. But I will be supporting the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. And just before I go to Councillor Philippine, I just have to acknowledge Shark and the team. And in their defence, the, the paper was done at, at short notice. The ability to have the entire narrative of climate change and the current um, science may well have taken several um, trailer loads of of reporting to go with it so there is an element of taken as read and for that I acknowledge the work the staff have put into it and I take a little bit of I take all the responsibility for the fact that this is simply a request for climate change emergency based on everything else we know so your points well made thank you councillor Simpson councillor Filipaina uh, thank you chair um, I know I won't get an applause after this with exactly what I'm about to say, but it is what it is. Um, Chair, when I get conflicted, especially around climate change, I go to CNN. And the reason I go to CNN is because I'm looking at all that is uh, happening in the States. It is shocking what is happening in the States. Um, when I look at Aotearoa, there are issues there that are coming through as well. So. Is climate change an emergency? Hell, it is. We all know it's an emergency. And this particular item is around declaring that climate change emergency. It's not about what we're going to do with it, although there are some bullet points in there to say that, look, here's what we're going to do. That was discussed in the previous item, Chair, and I have no issues in saying that how that was done in the order that was done was the correct way to be done. Because if, you, if you're hearing some of the people who have said around this table, you have a look at it. The only change with that particular item, the previous item, Chair, the only change was the fact that we were going to have a look, and rightly so, at the budget to go out and, and end up engaging with our community. Now, is, is the time that we have um, when the agenda went out uh, the correct time? It appears it may not. We, we may have to uh, increase that time. So be it. But at least we will make that decision, decision after. But we have said that this is the framework. I spoke to John um, about 45 an hour, minutes ago, an hour ago, and asked him about the action plans. And he pointed them out to me after reading it myself. I then had a look and I said to John, John, these action plans, I mean, you know, I mean, my, my understanding with these action plans is that it's all of Auckland approach. It's just not Auckland Council. It's all of Auckland approach. And that's exactly what the situation is. Now, look, we will make that decision around whether there's sufficient time to engage with our community. Chair, with, with, um, I, I want to acknowledge you in regards to listening to the community. They've asked us, we, we all received the um, emails in regards to declaring a state of emergency, a climate change emergency. You listened to them. In five of this report, you asked our staff to go out, have a look at it, and just see what other uh, countries and uh, councils are doing. They brought that back. Then the recommendations came through. So, Chair, I do not take uh, what some of the councils around here have said around the order, and, and, and this is so confusing. I'm not confused. There is a climate change. I want to acknowledge um, the people who have spoken and, and emphasising that. I want to acknowledge our rangatahi as well. Yeah. So, look, Chair, from my perspective... I wasn't um, getting look, the wind-up. I'm making Sorry? gesticulations to Councillor <laughs> Clough. You are not getting the wind-up. Oh. I thought it was a wind-up. Yeah, <laughs> so... <laughs> no, he's only on three okay. minutes. 
So, so thanks, Chair, but I, I'm going to wind up because I saw your hand go like that, so, <laughs> so I'd do that. So, look, I want to acknowledge everybody, um, people here, our staff, but ultimately for me, Chair, what we are doing is right, and uh, I look forward, whether I'm, I'm around this table or not, uh, but I look forward to doing as much as I can to help not only Auckland Council, but Auckland as a whole and Aotearoa in regards to this emergency. So, Chair, I will definitely be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Final word, Councillor Clough. I think it's a wind down. Um, I'm, I'm just going to be very brief, and I just really want to just give some recognition to the fact we are actually doing quite a lot at the moment. And if you look at Clause B, the first part of Clause B there, in my ward, I'm getting it in the neck. Stuff is writing articles, uh, how terrible it is for the motorists uh, uh, getting held up. But we're building resilience in our system now. We're replacing a whole water main because we are concerned about the resilience of the old one. We are replacing culverts um, because we are more than concerned about the capacity of the culverts we've got. New Lynn got totally flooded and we spent $30 million to fix it uh, because inadequate culverts, culverts breaking down. We are doing a whole lot of stuff now and I just would like that recognised and I just think we need to, and includes the press, that when they do a story about something, they should be talking about not how the motorists are held up for another 30 minutes and oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. There should be an explanation as to why we are doing that work to increase the resilience of the system, to deal with emergencies that happen, which is the sort of one in 50 year sort of storms we're now getting with greater frequency. So I just want that recognition. I just wonder, we need to be explaining that a lot more because we're not really, none of the resolutions there are really uh, making sure that we explain a lot of the things we do uh, because we are just trying to meet and adjust and, and deal with climate change. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Councillor Clow, wise words, and that's why having climate change in our committee reports is so critical, because when the media do give us a hard time, it's very hard for us to retrospectively say, yes, we have spent another seven million making that culvert wider or daylighting that stream, because that's the only way that it's actually going to be resilient for the next 50 years and save money going forward. So I just want to thank the committee for your passionate and well thought through speeches and ideas on this. It is critical. And I want to end by, and hold on to your hat, Councillor Newman, I'm actually going to agree with you. I think this is one of those where we have to put the energy and time into doing this well with our community because we are well versed in these issues. We are have information at our fingertips. We have staff who inform us. We're connected with networks to whom this is their daily discussion. They're intellectually connected with us, but there's a whole vast group of Auckland out there to whom this is a complete anathema. It is uncharted territory for them and it seems to be irrelevant and it's our job as we go with the climate change emergency discussion as well as the climate change framework discussion out into all those communities and dignify them with a sensible well constructed and timely consultation so I think by bringing the two together we need to be talking to those people that um, Councillor Newman quite rightly raised. So I'm going to put the recommendation. It's been moved and seconded. Oh, and Councillor Casey, we added in, sorry, there's the requesting staff of council-controlled organisations to include climate change impact in the committee reports. So I'm going to put the recommendation which does declare a climate change emergency just so that people are comfortable and they know what we're voting on. Moved and seconded by myself, seconded by Mayor Goff. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried unanimously. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor. <laughs> right.
Christine. Thank you, councillors. Let's. Um, we, that's not going to happen to us again, I don't think. So thank you, thank you to our members of the community who were here for your forbearance and for putting up with the long debate and discussion. We're now going to adjourn for half an hour. You're welcome to come back and listen to water, but we understand if you need to go. Thank you.